Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to lecture 11 of the course on multivariate data mining methods and applications. The title of this lecture is Principal Component and Least Angle Regression. In last couple of lectures, we have discussed the problem of multicollinearity, its consequences and its different measures. Then we have also discussed different estimation procedures which we can use to overcome the problem of multicollinearity. In particular, we have discussed rich regression estimation procedure and least absolute shrinkage and selection operator that is lasso estimator for estimating the regression parameters. Now, in this lecture, we are going to consider some more procedures for estimating the regression coefficients. We are going to discuss generalized inverse regression estimator, principal component regression estimator and least angle regression estimator in this lecture. Now, before coming to the generalized inverse regression estimator or principal component regression estimator, first we consider an example of lasso. Uh, again, we take the empty cars data set and uh, for solving this problem, we use GLM net package in R. Uh, again, here our input variables are MPG, WT, DRAT and QSEC and output variable is HP. You remember that uh, we have taken the same example for the rich regression estimator also. Now, if we fit the full model, then we got these estimators. The estimator for the intercept term is 473.779, then we get corresponding standard error also t value and p value. And on the basis of p values, we observe that the intercept term is significant. Similarly, we got the regression coefficients corresponding to MPG, WT, DRAT and QSEC also and corresponding standard errors t values and p values. And from these results, we observe that at least at 5 percent level of significance, these three variables or the regression coefficients of these three variables are not significant. Now, we apply lasso regression to estimate the regression parameters. Uh, notice that here we are denoting the penalty parameter by lambda which is same as our C and the reason is that in the software for the penalty parameter the notation lambda has been used. So, to obtain this lambda, we use tenfold cross validation and uh, the best possible value of lambda is 2.668219. We have also plotted mean squared error against the value of log lambda. Then we obtain this model when for the optimum value of lambda which we have obtained earlier, we fit the model. This is the intercept term or estimate of the intercept term. This is the estimate of the regression coefficient corresponding to MPG and then we get the regression coefficient corresponding to WT. The regression coefficient corresponding to D right is 0. 
and the regression coefficient corresponding to q sec is minus 19.43425. Now, this is the beauty of lasso that it has made this regression coefficient to be 0. Uh, remember that in in this regression the shrinkage has been applied to all the parameters or the estimators of all the parameters, but it does not serve the purpose of variable selection because no coefficient becomes 0. So, you cannot use this regression for variable selection purpose. Whereas, if we use lasso, then in this example, this estimator of regression parameter becomes 0. So, it lasso has not selected this particular variable d that. You can even use lasso procedure for predicting the output variable. For example, suppose we want to predict HP horsepower for MPG equal to 25, WT equal to 3.0, D that equal to 4.5 and QSEC equal to 20.5. Then this is the predicted value. So, we observe that which regression shrinks all coefficients towards 0, but it does not remove any of the coefficients or any of the variables. Lasso regression can remove predictors from the model by shrinking the coefficients completely to 0. So, this is the beauty of lasso. It can shrink some of the coefficients completely to 0 or it is able to remove the unimportant predictors, the predictors which are not able to explain the variations in output variable. Further, we have used GLM net function of R for obtaining rich regression estimator or for obtaining lasso estimator. But one can use this function of R to fit the model with other penalty functions. So, suppose you want to fit the model using elastic net penalty, then you can use the same function of R for fitting the model with elastic net penalty. Now, we consider generalized inverse regression. So, again we consider the model y equal to x beta plus u, we assume that the intercept term is 0. Then suppose x transpose x which is of order r cross r is singular or it may be nearly singular. Then OLS estimator requires x transpose x inverse. Now, suppose x transpose x is uh, singular, then you cannot obtain x transpose x inverse. One of the alternative is you use generalized inverse in place of x transpose x inverse. So, in the expression for least square estimator, we replace x transpose x inverse by the generalized inverse of x transpose x. Now, suppose rank of x transpose x is equal to t, which is less than r. Then, we consider the spectral decomposition of x transpose x, which is say v 1 lambda v 1 transpose. Lambda is a diagonal matrix with diagonal elements lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda t. So, actually this lambda is diagonal matrix with diagonal elements consist of non zero eigenvalues of x transpose x. Lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda t these are the non zero eigenvalues of x transpose x. 
and v1 is equal to say small v1 is small v2 so on the small vt this is r cross t matrix and this matrix is consists of the corresponding eigen vectors say v1 is the eigen vector corresponding to lambda 1 v2 is the eigen vector corresponding to lambda 2 and so on v t is the eigen vector corresponding to lambda t. And using these eigen vectors we form the matrix v 1. All these eigen vectors are different columns of v 1. Now, suppose by capital G we denote the move Penrose generalized inverse of x transpose x. Then G is defined as say we denote g equal to x transpose x plus this is equal to v 1 lambda inverse v 1 transpose which is equal to summation j equal to 1 to t 1 upon lambda j v j v j transpose. So, we take this as the generalized inverse or move Penrose generalized inverse of x transpose x. And you can easily verify it that this provides a generalized inverse of x transpose x. This satisfies the condition of generalized inverse. Then the gen generalized inverse regression estimator of beta is say beta hat g equal to g x transpose y. So, in the expression for OLS estimator you have replaced this g x transpose x inverse by g and then we may write this x transpose y equal to s say and we substitute the value of g. So, we get summation j equal to 1 to t 1 upon lambda j v j v j transpose into s. Now, this beta hat g minimizes the error sum of squares within the t dimensional linear subspace spanned by v and beta hat g is a constraint least squares estimator of beta under the constraint that rank of x transpose x is equal to t and it is conditionally unbiased. Conditionally unbiased means the rank of x transpose x is equal to t. As long as x transpose x has rank t, the estimator beta hat g is unbiased. And not only unbiased, in that case it minimizes the error sum of squares within the t dimensional linear subspace spanned by v. Now, we write z 1 equal to x v 1. Then the rows of z 1 are called the scores of first t principal components of x. Notice that the order of x is n cross r and order of v 1 is r cross t. So, z 1 is of order n cross t. So, z 1 is consist of those which are the scores of first t principal components of x. Then the, if we regress y on z 1, then it is called the principal component regression. So, now we come to the principal component regression estimator and then we will also observe that how this estimator is connected with the generalized inverse. Now, suppose v is equal to v 1 v 2 v r which is of order r cross r uh, where v j is the eigen vector of x transpose x and v j is corresponding to the eigen value lambda j. Then z i is equal to x v i. So, this is the ith principal component 
and z i transpose z i is equal to lambda i. Actually, z i transpose z i is equal to v i transpose x transpose x v i and then x transpose x v i is equal to lambda i v i and then v i transpose v i is equal to 1. So, you get lambda i here where lambda i is the ith largest eigenvalue of x transpose x. Then we write z equal to x v which is equal to z 1, z 2, z r. So, this z is n cross r matrix of principal components. Now, we write the model in this form say y equal to x v v transpose beta plus u. We write x beta equal to x v v transpose beta because v v transpose is equal to identity matrix. And then we write x v equal to z and v transpose beta equal to theta. So, we get the model y equal to z theta plus u. Then we consider the steps for obtaining the principal component estimator. Now, we delete some of the principal components z i is corresponding to small or 0 eigenvalues. Say if some eigenvalue is 0, then we delete the corresponding principal component and if some eigenvalue is very small, then also we delete the corresponding principal component. So, we partition z as says z equal to x v 1 v 2 and x v 1 is equal to say z 1, x v 2 is equal to z 2. So, we partition z as z 1, z 2 and basically we are retaining the principal components corresponding to v 1 and we are deleting the principal components corresponding to v 2. So, z 1 is the matrix of principal components to be retained and z 2 is the matrix of principal components to be deleted. Further, z 1 and z 2 are orthogonal to each other. So, we write the model as y equal to z 1 theta 1 plus z 2 theta 2 plus u and then what we do? we delete this part and if we delete this part, then we get the model y equal to z 1 theta 1 plus u and then we obtain the OLS estimator for theta 1, which is theta 1 head equal to z 1 transpose z 1 inverse z 1 transpose y and it has covariance matrix sigma square u z 1 transpose z 1 inverse. So, it is simple you simply write the model in this form then we delete this part from the model because this part is corresponding to either uh, eigenvalues which are uh, 0 or eigenvalues which are very small or negligible. So, you can take those eigenvalues to be 0 and then we consider this model. We apply OLS procedure for estimating theta 1 and this is the OLS estimator for theta 1 and obviously, it has the variance covariance matrix sigma square u z, trans z 1 transpose z 1 inverse. Now, we can obtain beta also, beta is equal to v theta. So, from here we observe that theta is equal to v transpose beta. So, beta is equal to v theta and then we write v theta as v 1 theta 1 plus v 2 theta 2. And since omitting the components of z 2 means 
we are setting theta to equal to 0. So, you can write beta equal to v 1 theta 1 if theta 2 is equal to 0. And in that case, the principal component estimator of beta is beta hat equal to v 1 theta 1 hat, which is equal to v theta hat star, where theta hat star is equal to theta 1 hat transpose 0 transpose whole transpose. Actually, this principal component estimator has lower values than the OLS estimator, but it is biased unless this restriction v 2 theta 2 equal to 0 is satisfied. If this restriction is satisfied, then the principal component estimator is unbiased because in that case beta is exactly equal to v 1 theta 1. So, in that case your model y equal to z 1 theta 1 plus u is correct, but if the second part is not equal to 0 then you are actually ignoring some information from the model or you can say you are ignoring this part, you are ignoring some of the relevant variables, some of the relevant part of the model and because you are ignoring this part, the estimator becomes biased. Now, when rank of x is equal to t, the principal component estimator is the same as the generalized inverse estimator. You can easily verify it. If you consider rank of x equal to t, then the expression for the principal component estimator is identical with the expression for the generalized inverse estimator. Further, the principal component estimator is restricted unbiased estimator means it is unbiased subject to the restriction that v 2 theta 2 is equal to 0. Now, how to select the number of principal components to be omitted? One of the possibility is visual examination of a scree plot. Now, what is scree plot? Suppose lambda 1, lambda 2, so on lambda k, these are the eigenvalues arranged in decreasing order. That is lambda 1 is greater than or equal to lambda 2 and so on greater than or equal to lambda k. Then we plot lambda j's against j. So, here we have plotted lambda j's against j on x axis we take j, on y axis we take lambda j. Then select the index of the last component before the plot flattens. Now, here you observe that after this point or after this point the plot almost flattens. So, this is how you can select the number of principal components to be retained in the model. You can use the scree plot. Now, we take this example of empty cars data again to fit principal component regression. So, in all we have 32 observations. Again we take h p as our response variable and our detector variables or input variables are mpg, displacement, disp, dirat, wt and qsec. And we have used the R package pls 
and then in the cross validation we used 10 random segments that is 10 fold cross validation. Now, first we have calculated the root mean squared error using 10 fold cross validation. So, just if we use the model having intercept term, these are the values of root mean squared error and adjusted value of root mean squared error. If we include the first component, then we get these values. If we include first two components, we get these values and on the basis of three components, we get these values and so on. Now, notice that up to this point, these values are decreasing, but after that, the values started increasing. Then, variance explained, say so, using the first component, we get the percentage of variance explained here using first two components, first three components. In fact, after first two components, we observe that there is a very small variation. So, if we use the model involving just the intercept term, the test RMSE is 69.66. If we add the first principal component, it becomes 43.30. If we further add the second principal component, it becomes 34.25. And after that, adding any additional principal components increases the test R M S C. So, this implies that the optimal number of principal components in the final model is 2. Now, this is the plot of cross validation R M S C and M S C. So, again we observe the same phenomena up to 2 you get decrease and after that it starts gradually increasing. Then R square and here you take the number of components. Again adding two principal components improves the model fit, adding more principal component even worsens the fit say so, up to 2. It improves the fit and after that it worsens the fit. Prediction MSC is 56.86549 and then we fit the final model which is based on first two principal components and uh, these are the values of regression parameters. Corresponding to MPG you obtain the regression coefficient minus 18.1 for displacement, you obtain 32.01, for DRAT 8.5, for WT 5.1, for QSEC minus 13.36. Notice that in the final model, you have used just two principal components, but you are getting estimators for the regression parameters for corresponding to all the input variables. So, it is not like a variable selection procedure where some of the variables are completely discarded from the model. Here, the principal components are discarded what you have done? You have transformed the model, so that your new input variables are your principal components and then you have selected a subset of principal components for fitting the model 
and ultimately you again transform the parameters of the regression coefficients corresponding to the fitted model for the principal components and using the relationship between original beta coefficients and theta 1, you can get estimators for all the regression parameters. Now, we come to least angle regression. Now, in forward stepwise regression, what we do? We start with only interceptor and then in each step, we identify the best variable to include in the active set and accordingly, we update the least squares fit. We start with just intercept term, then include the best variable from the available variables and then we estimate the model. Then we go for including the second variable which is best suited and again we obtain the least square estimators and so on. This is how we proceed in forward stepwise regression. This least angle regression utilizes as much of a predictor as it deserves and how we do it? Say first it selects the variable most correlated with the response. So, initially the variable which is most correlated with the response is selected and then it moves its coefficient continuously towards its least squares value. So, we just do not take the coefficient equal to the least squares value, we just keep on moving it towards the least square value. We also observe its correlation with the evolving residual. Naturally, the least square value provides the best fit. So, as we move towards the least square value, the correlation with the evolving residual decreases in absolute value. And we also keep an eye on the correlation with the residual with other variables. As soon as another variable catches up in terms of correlation with the residual, the process is paused means what you have done, I again repeat, you have selected the variable which is most correlated with the response variable and then you move the coefficient continuously towards the least square value and you also observe the correlation with the evolving residual with the variable. Not only that, you also observe the correlation of the evolving residuals with the other variables also. Now, this correlation is decreasing. Correlation is with the first selected variable. So, there might be uh, some point at which another variable catches up in terms of correlation with the residual. So, another variable has higher correlation than the first variable selected with the residual. Then we stop the process and the second variable joins the active set. So, you include the second variable also in the active set. Again, their coefficients are moved together in a way that keeps their correlations tied and decreasing. Then enters the third variable. The process is continued until all the variables are in the model. So, 
we continue new this process with two variables unless the third variable enters then uh, we continue the process with three variables unless the fourth variable enters at and so on. And this ends up the full least squares fit. So, this is the algorithm for Lars. First, we standardize the predictors to have mean 0 and unit norm. In the second step, we start with the residual v equal to y minus y bar. We are including just the intercept turn only. So, your residual is y minus y bar. All the regression coefficients are equal to 0. Then you find the predictor x j which is most correlated with v. And uh, once you find this predictor, this predictor enters in the process. Now, we move the corresponding regression coefficient beta j from 0 towards its least square coefficient. Notice that when beta j is equal to the least square coefficient, the correlation coefficient between x j and the residual becomes 0. So, as we keep on moving beta j towards the least square coefficient, the correlation decreases in magnitude, it decreases towards 0. Now, in between suppose some other variable x k has more correlation with the current residual as does x j. Then x k enters into the picture. Now, we move both beta j and beta k towards their joint least squares coefficient. So, what we do? We run regression between y and x j x k obtain the least squares coefficients and then we keep on moving beta j and beta k towards the joint least squares coefficient. And uh, as we keep on moving these values beta j and beta k, we get modified residuals also. So, we observe the correlation coefficient between current residual and x j x k until some other variable x l has as much correlation with the current residual. So, if uh, there is some other variable x l which has as much correlation with current residuals as x j and x k, this variable enters into the picture. Now, if a non-zero coefficient hits 0, we drop that variable from the active set of variables. So, during this process, suppose some non-zero coefficient becomes 0, then immediately we drop that variable from the active set of variables and then we recompute the current joint least squares direction. Now, we continue this process until all our predictors have been entered and uh, once all the predictors, all our predictors have been entered, we stop and after minimum of n r steps, a full least square solution is obtained. So, this method of estimating the regression parameters is called the least angle regression. Now, we consider the advantages of Lars method. This Lars method is computationally as fast as forward selection. 
and then this procedure produces a full piece wise linear solution path, uh, which is useful in cross validation to tune the model. So, you can easily use it in cross validation to tune the model. Then the coefficients of two variables almost equally correlated with the response increase at approximately the same rate. So, if there are two variables which are almost equally correlated with the response variable, then usually the coefficients of those two variables increase at approximately the same rate. Then this method can be modified to produce efficient algorithms for methods like lasso and forward stepwise regression. And uh, this method can also be used when r is greater than or equal to n, when you have more number of variables than the number of observations. Now, these are the disadvantages of Lars method with high dimensional multi collinear independent variables the selected variables may not be the actual causal variables. So, suppose in your problem you have a very high dimensional input variables or independent variables and these independent variables are multi collinear, there is high multi collinearity then the selected variables may not be the actual causal variables. And uh, this problem arises because of you can say some sort of confusion between multi collinear or highly correlated independent variables. Two independent variables are highly correlated, one of them is actually causal variable but instead of that variable, the other variable enters as the causal variable in the model. So, this may be possible if we are using the Lars method. Then Lars is based upon an iterative refitting of the residuals. So, it is sensitive to the effects of noise. If there is some noise present in the model, then it may affect the Lars estimator, because uh, you remember at each stage you are using the correlation between available independent variables and the residuals. Then since high dimensional data often have multi collinearity across some variables. The problem that Lars has with correlated variables may limit its application to high dimensional data. Say for highly multi collinear data, Lars has this problem the selected variables may not be the actual causal variables. Therefore, sometimes it becomes difficult to use the Lars method for high dimensional data and in data mining problems often you get high dimensional data and uh, such high dimensional data often have high level of multi collinearity also across the variables. So, in that case it is not advisable to use the last procedure for estimation purpose. Now, if r is greater than n minus 1 then in that case Lars algorithm reaches a zero residual solution after n minus 1 steps. So, obviously, you have to stop at n minus 1 th step. Further at the beginning of kth step suppose a k is the active set of variables, we denote the active set of variables by a k and beta a k this is the coefficient vector for the active set. Then v k equal to y minus x a k beta a k. 
this is the current residual. Then there will be k minus 1 non zero values and the remaining coefficients you can say you have taken as 0. So, the one just entered will be 0. The direction of the step is say delta k equal to x a k transpose x a k inverse x a k transpose x a k v k. So, this is the direction of the next step and then we update beta a k as beta a k alpha equal to beta a k plus alpha into this direction delta k. Here now this direction chosen keep the correlations tight and decreasing. We move the coefficients in this direction and uh, it keeps the correlation tight uh, and uh, then these correlations keep on decreasing as we move beta a k towards the OLS estimator corresponding OLS estimator. Uh, of course, uh, here we are talking about the active set only the direction of the regression parameters corresponding to the active set. Now, if the fit vector is f hat k equal to x a k beta a k, then it updates as f hat k alpha equal to f hat k alpha into w k. So, this is how the fit vector updates and w k which is equal to x a k delta k is the new fit direction and it makes the smallest and equal angle with each of the predictors in a k. a k is your active set and uh, this w k which is the new fit direction makes the smallest and equal angle with each of the predictors in a k. So, actually the coefficients in law change in piecewise linear fashion. So, this relationship is linear according to which the coefficients change. So, in this lecture we have uh, discussed three estimation procedures generalized inverse regression method, principal component regression method and least angle regression method for estimating the parameters of multiple linear regression model. We can use generalized inverse regression method when the design matrix that is the matrix of observations on input variables is not of full column rank. Uh, of course, uh, in that case we cannot use the OLS procedure. So, in ordinary least square procedure we just replace the inverse of x transpose x by its generalized inverse to get the generalized inverse estimator. And then we have considered the principal component regression, which can be used when the design matrix or the observations matrix is highly multicollinear. That is, the input variables are highly correlated. In fact, uh, if the design matrix is not a full column rank and in principal component regression we use as many principal components as the rank of the design matrix, then the principal component regression estimator reduces to the generalized inverse regression estimator. 
And then we have also discussed uh, least angle regression estimator for estimating the regression parameter. So, I am going to stop here. Thank you. Chitwan Lalji, a PhD student of Health Economics under the supervision of Dr. Debian Pakrashi uh, from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Kanpur. In one of my essays, I am interested in understanding the relationship between consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators. Health indicators, both subjective and objective health indicators like mental health, self-assessed health, various measures of blood pressure and various measures of cholesterol. Uh, measures of blood pressure like systolic and diastolic BP, you have your incidence of high BP, MAP and incidence of high MAP. And as far as cholesterol is concerned, I have tried to concentrate more on total cholesterol, good cholesterol and incidence of high cholesterol. Now before I go on to what have been my major contributions and various policy implications, I would like to briefly tell you about the policy initiatives of WHO and various countries. The WHO, that is the World Health Organization, it started with a campaign of five a day. That is, you should have five portions of fruits and vegetables per day. That would be approximately, you could say, 400 grams of fruits and vegetables. Now, a portion, before we go further, I'll just tell you what exactly is a portion. One portion is equivalent to a medium-sized apple or one small glass of fruit juice, which is approximately 150 milliliters and uh, maybe three teaspoons of vegetables. So, uh, the WHO went for the five a day campaign, which was further taken up by various countries. Countries like UK, Netherlands, Germany, Norway, they adopted the five a day policy, while some went for expansionary dietary policies like France, Australia, Canada, Denmark. So, for example, Australia, it went for go for 2 plus 5 policy in which it said that you should consume five por 2 portions of fruits and 5 portions of vegetables per day. And USA went for a policy of fruits and vegetables, more matters. That is, you must consume more and more fruits and vegetables. Now, irrespective of these expansionary dietary policies and dietary propagations, it has been found that only 28% of women and 25% of men they actually meet the recommended dietary norms of five a, po five a day portion. So, the major contribution of my work is firstly to find an association between fruits and vegetables, whether there exists a relationship between fruits and vegetables and health indicators and if they exist, whether if due to heterogeneity in the data, so I will be doing it according to age, by gender and by uh, your weight. So, apart from that, I will go for policy recommendations in which I will, I am basically studying uh, how much fruits and vegetables matter, apart from that, which type matters more. So, for that, I have taken data from the Health Survey of England. Health Survey of England is an annual survey which takes uh, data, which conducts information regularly on demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. You have your lifestyle behaviors like an individual smokes or doesn't smoke, alcohol consumption, you have your sedentary and physical activities and you have various health uh, indicators also which have been collected. Uh, so, uh, before I go on to what exactly is my research, I would like to concentrate more on fruits and vegetables like what kind of questions were asked in the survey. Questions like what kind of fresh fruit do you eat? Did you eat any dried fruit yesterday? Don't count dried fruits in cereals, cakes. Apart from that, for vegetables, they asked how many tablespoons of vegetables did you eat yesterday? So, approximately after this whole survey was conducted, data was converted into portions of fruits. And uh, like for example, three, por three tablespoons of vegetables is equivalent to one portion. So, data was converted and provided to the users, that is us from the UK Data Health Survey. So, the major con con contributions of my paper is that I found a strong negative association between uh, 
intake of fruits and self-assessed health. Then various measures of uh, blood pressure like mean arterial pressure, high mean arterial pressure, high blood pressure, systolic and diastolic BP and your total cholesterol. Apart from that, I have found a strong positive association between consumption of vegetables and good cholesterol. So it is recommended in a way that if you want to control your blood pressure, you must consume more and more fruits. And as far as vegetables are concerned, they impact your good cholesterol. Apart from that, I went in for a falsification test. A falsification test is basically conducted to know whether the model that you have adopted and the conclusions that you are drawing are not spurious. So if uh, a falsification test is done to know, in a way it is tested by seeing an indicator, a health indicator which is not being impacted by your consumption of fruits and vegetables. And then see, we see whether there is significant result or not. If there is no significant result, that means your model is good and your results are non-spurious. So what we did is for falsification test, we took ear complaints and infectious diseases. Now ear complaints like if you are deaf since birth or you have some kind of imbalance, body imbalance, that is not being impacted by your post consumption of fruits and vegetables. And we did find insignificant results. Apart from that, infectious diseases like HIV, A, HIV AIDS, etc., we found similar insignificant results, indicating that our, for, uh, that our results are not spurious, non spurious. Apart from that, we went, uh, since there was a, a lot of heterogeneity in the data, like uh, by gender, by age, and by weight, we, can, we did the regression analysis. We found results which stated that as far as uh, fruits are concerned, it impacts a male's health more than a female's health. So it is basically said a, a man should consume more fruits to impact his health, whereas as far as vegetables are concerned, they impact a women's health more. But this has been only seen as far as cholesterol is concerned, the various measures of cholesterol like total cholesterol, good cholesterol and your incidence of getting high cholesterol. Now after this, we went in for a policy implication and in the policy implication, we found, we tried to find two policy implication, what matters and exactly how much portion matters. So as far as how much portion matters, we have found that on an average, five or more portions of fruits impact your overall health, that is your self-assessed health, your MAP, your incidence of high MAP and incidence of high BP. But if you want to have a good mental health, so you can optimize your mental health by consuming three or four portions of fruits as well. And similarly, has, uh, as far as self-assessed health and total cholesterol is concerned, an individual must consume four to five portions to optimally have the impact of consumption of fruits. Apart from that, vegetables have had a very little impact on your health. It only impacts your incidence of getting high MAP and high BP. And uh, you, it's seen that only it impacts when you consume five or more portions of fruits. So an optimum consumption of five or more portions of fruits and vegetables are recommended. But fruits have a more impact on your overall health, on various measures like self-assessed health, mental health, your various measures of blood pressure and various cholesterol levels. Another thing that we find is which type of fruit matters. It has been seen that all size fruits, they impact your self-assessed health, your systolic and diastolic blood pressure, your mean arterial pressure, your high BP and incidence of getting high MAP and high cholesterol. But we find that uh, as far as frozen fruits or canned fruits are concerned, they have a they help in regulating your incidence of getting high MAP or high BP, but it has a trade-off that means there is something negative happening, it reduces the good cholesterol in your body. Apart from this, it, if, you ha if you have an incidence of getting high cholesterol, it is recommended that you must consume fruit juices because it has a impact in reducing your probability of getting high cholesterol. And uh, dried fruits, they impact your self-assessed health. As far as vegetables are concerned, very little impact has been seen. It has only been seen in case of a uh, uh, portion of salads and its association with self-assessed health. Another thing that they have seen is vegetables in composite, they have an association with good cholesterol. So overall, my research basically says that there is an association between consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators. And um, 
it is highly recommended that an individual in order to be healthy must consume five or more portions of fruits and five or more portions of vegetables per day but fruits have a more impact on your overall health apart from that all size fruits they have a better impact on your overall health your mental health various measures of blood pressure and cholesterol so thank you